Hey guys, how's it going? I think I'm going to continue with doing the run-throughs of the first John, the first general epistle of John. And I'm going to be on chapter 4. And so I'm just going to start it. So verse 1 says, Beloved, or beloved, or however you want to pronounce that, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And so he starts off with beloved, and you know, He's very endearing to who he's writing to. He's, you know, um, believers, you know, they're loved by Paul. We're loved by God, obviously. Um, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Okay. So he's basically saying to test uh, people, test prophets or preachers, whether they are of God. So the spirits represent, you know, either the person or, you know, which manner the person is. Um, and so, yeah, false prophets have gone out into the world. Um We'll continue on to verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And so here's a way that we can test them. Here's a way that we can know if somebody is a true prophet or a false prophet of God. And uh, so, <clears throat> you know, and, that, and that, that test is whether they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh or not. And so, you know, I've talked to brothers and sisters that, you know, we can disagree on a lot of different things. And uh, I've, when I first started my ministry and, or my making videos on YouTube, whatever you want to say, uh, I, you know, when I first got saved, just the stance that I had on things have changed. You know, I've come to believe different doctrines and different things, but I've also kind of, pulled back on like a strictness you know when I first started the a lot of the independent fundamental Baptist sermons and stuff that I watched very strict on different things and and I've come to realize some of the more important things about the faith and obviously you know one of the important things that we read right here that the Bible says is important is whether somebody confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh that's kind of an obvious thing you know you can't really be a Christian and deny that and I think that this has something to say about the deity of Christ because there's an important point of him coming in the flesh. You know, it's not just that a man named Jesus existed. Even historians believe that, you know, people who are atheists or don't believe in God or even people who believe in other religions, they might agree with that. But it's the fact that God the Son, that God, um, you know, and the Son who was, you know, prophesied of that he would come, uh, you know, the prophecy was fulfilled and that uh, the Son, God, uh, came in the flesh. That he took on a human nature. That's important. Um, and so that's how we can know. Uh, and so basically, I, I think that, you know, he's saying, you know, proclaiming that Jesus is God and that he is the Son of God is a way to test, obviously, whether a person's a believer or not. And, you know, I, I don't know the historical context and all that, but they had a lot of Jews back then, obviously, that, you know, denied that Jesus was the Messiah. They denied that he was the Son of God, and that could be what he's talking about here. You know, a lot of the Jewish believers who claimed to be followers of Jehovah, yet they rejected his Son. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. So there's like a there's a, a positive in verse two. You know, whoever confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. Then there's the negative. Whoever does not confess this is not of God. And um, and you know, it just makes me think of lordship, salvation, and stuff, which you know I believe. Uh, you know, it certainly needs to be defined, and this is kind of off topic, but I'm thinking about the word confess, you know, uh, because there's the verses that say, you know, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, basically. And uh, it's more than just, you know, announcing it, but it's, uh, 
it's believing it and following it. It's, uh, uh, so anyways, that's, that's kind of off the topic there, but, and then it says, and this is that spirit of Antichrist. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now, already, is it in the world. And so, uh, again, there's a lot of confusion, I think, about, you know, the, the term Antichrist, and, and people think that, looking at the book of Revelation and Daniel and different things, thinking that there's, you know, one particular person who's going to come who's, who's the Antichrist. I don't think that is so, um, but he's basically saying that anybody who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, manif manifest in the flesh, is an Antichrist. And, um, And so I think I would like to look into it more, and I know that a lot, there's, you know, there's probably like a majority, there's a lot of believers and commentators who are going to take this position, this futurist position of the Antichrist coming, so uh, they would probably say different than what I would think, but I'd like to look into it more. But, you know, I think that he says, you know, where have you have heard it should come? So people think that this is still uh, something that's, particular that's going to come in the future and, and it could be it could have even been speaking of you know a certain king or ruler back then but also you know and then he says and even now already is in the world so he could say you know you've, you've you've heard that it should come and it's here now basically is what he could be saying you know it doesn't mean that there's even more some, something particular coming in the future you could could just be saying, you know, you've heard there will be antichrists, and there are. But anyways, I'm going to continue and not get, try to not get stuck on that. Verse 4, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, the antichrists, the people who deny that Jesus has come in the flesh, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I used to really like that contemporary Christian song, I don't remember who did it, um, uh, pretty popular band like mercy i don't know if it was mercy me or not but i they used to play on the radio that i listened to all the time greater is he that is in you that is in than that is in the world and uh so it talks about overcoming them it talks about overcoming the antichrist you know it talks about overcoming satan and, you know, the powers of the devil um, through Christ and our salvation. Because, you know, Jesus overcame the devil. He overcame, uh, you know, the world. And through him, you know, we are overcomers as well. And so we even overcome the Antichrist. And so that also makes me think that, you know, these are not just people who deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. These are not just people who... Uh, are atheists or whatever, uh, but they're also people who persecute Christians, okay? I think this this is talking about even people who even go even further, and, um, you know, they want to do harm to believers, you know, uh, in whatever manner they are persecuting the Church of Christ, and that is really these antichrists. Um, these are like foes of the Church, Okay, and he's uh, reassuring us that, you know, no matter what they do, uh, remember, you know, that we have overcome them. And um, so, so it's this reassurance and this hope that we know that in the end, you know, we're on the right side. We're with the Lord, and we are going to reign victorious. We are going to be rewarded, and the Antichrist will have God's vengeance and wrath on them. So, let's continue with verse 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. And I'm just going to continue on, because the, the thought kind of continues. Uh, in this whole section, you know, the, the E-sword here labels as test the spirits. 
verses 1 through 6. But verse 6 says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So they are of the world, we are of God. No, um, sorry I keep repeating myself those little phrases, but, so he, he says to test the spirits in the beginning, and at the end of this section here he says, hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Truth is those of us that know God, that proclaim Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Error is those who are antichrist because they deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. And uh, I can see Calvinists probably taking these verses out of context, as they always do. You know, we are of God, and he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. And, you know, they'd probably try to twist that and say, you know, that unbelievers can't hear God because, you know, God made them that way or whatever. It's not what it says here, though. Um, you know, they hear not because they choose not to, because they reject God. And um, there's this contrast between believers, Christians, and Antichrist. And so, you know, what was the purpose of this? You know, it's, I mean, for one, you know, like I said, there's that reassurance, there's that hope that they're going to, you know, be victorious even through persecution and everything else. But also, you know, not to be deceived, to, you know, safeguard the church because, you know, maybe there are people uh, proclaiming to be of God, you know, but they were uh, denying that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, which kind of makes me think of Jehovah's Witnesses, because I've been thinking about them recently, but, you know, they they say they believe in Jehovah, but they don't believe that Jesus is Jehovah. They don't believe that Jesus was divine, and so they can't really believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, in the sense that I think uh, John is saying here. And I hope I didn't ever attribute to this, this epistle to Paul. I might sometimes because Paul wrote so many epistles. But i got to remember this is John that authored this. Let's continue on with the next section, God is Love. And so, beloved, again, and uh, this is verses 7 through 21. Let us love one another. For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. And these are themes that are just repeated over and over. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. An attribute of God, God is love. Uh, in its you know purest, holiest form. Um, and you know, there's so many... It's been said over and over again, I'm sure a lot of people that read the King James Bible and listen to independent fundamental Baptist preaching and, and whatever that, you know, a lot of these liberal churches and stuff want to focus on the love of God, but they don't want to focus, focus on, you know, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, or the, you know, God's justice, or, you know, God's wrath. And, you know, we got to take everything into uh, retrospective with God's character and his attributes, but... But God is love, there's no denying that, but um, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, he's not holy, or he's not the judge, you, you know. But love is, you know, one of the greatest commandments. God said that. Uh, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And that's basically kind of the gospel in a nutshell again. It sounds very much like John 3.16. God sent his only begotten son into the world. And we've talked about, you know, I've talked about the sonship of Christ. And, you know, I've wanted to do more studies on that. I need to finish those up. 
but also the eternal generation, how God was, or the Son was eternally begotten of the Father. Um, and so begotten doesn't mean that he was born in time uh, from God the Father, or that he, you know, came into existence, and th that there was a time that the Son wasn't, you know, he was always the Son, eternally begotten. And um, not, and you know, a son by nature, that and that Jesus is divine, not in the son in the sense that we are sons of God because we are adopted. Um, <clears throat> and he was sent by God, and I talked about how the sonship sonship means you know obedience to the Father, and, and um, God sent him, and Jesus came, and. Also, you know, we see the Trinity. We see two distinct persons. One sent the other. God the Father sent the Son. And the Son took on flesh and uh, was born into our world as a man, though he's a divine person. And, you know, he is known as Jesus. That we might live through him. Know, through believing in him that we may have eternal life and uh, true life and so verse 10 herein is love not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins and so I think you mentioned this previously about Jesus being the propiti propitiation for our sins and he said, you know, not for ours only, but for the whole world, you know, or, or that Jesus died for the whole world. Um, and so it's because of the sacrifice of Jesus, he took our place and um, we're forgiven of our sins through him. And this shows the love of God towards us. Um, you know, it shows the sacrifice of the Father and of the Son. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also we ought also to love one another. And I want to dwell again that, and I'm going to continue. He's going to talk about loving the brothers, I think, and stuff too. This, when he says love one another, it doesn't doesn't just mean within the church. I think it means within humanity, you know, mankind. We ought to love one another, everyone. <laughs> it's not just exclusive to brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John 4.12, uh, no man hath seen God at any time. Well, that's a very interesting verse. Uh, we, If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so, uh, yeah, that's kind of a controversial verse, I guess. And it's, you know, it doesn't need to be, but obviously, you know, I've said that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And he was seen of many, and yet here we have a verse that says, No man hath seen God at any time. So how do we interpret that? So uh, could we be speaking of God the Father, God in his truest divine essence. Okay, uh, not speaking of the humanity of Jesus, but um, the, the true divinity. And, uh, you know, and then there's, then again, you know, there's Isaiah... Uh, had visions, or you know, he went to heaven and, and saw God, and and uh, there was things like that before this. Uh, so it brings up questions, but there's no contradictions in Scripture, and we just have to uh, study and seek God to understand these. And I don't really want to comment on that a lot, except for what I already have. Uh, but. And it's not really even to get distracted on the, that that verse because, you know, a lot of people want to focus on that. But I think that even the main point of this verse is if we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. And so he's saying that, you know, people are going to see God through us by, you know, living as God wants us to live. We can show, you know, we are the light to the world, as Jesus said. That's basically the idea here. That's really the main focus of this. 
is that we are to love others as God loved us, and um, and through that they see God through us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. So there's this intimate relationship between us. It doesn't mean to be literally dwelling in anything like God, you know, is in our body. God's omnipresent. Um, it's not contained anywhere. But uh, this language is speaking of, you know, an intimate relationship. Um, because he hath given us of his spirit. You know, I'm thinking about dwelling in him and he and us uh, is also kind of, it could also kind of be like a figure of speech where you would say like somebody's in my heart, you know, this person's in my heart or whatever. Are they as a person literally in their heart? No. But it's saying that, you know, I'm thinking of this person, you know, this person means a lot to me. We have this relationship or whatever. That's the idea. And because he hath given us of his spirit. Oh, you know, Jesus talked about sending the Holy Spirit, um, which is very interesting too. Not that it wasn't already in the world, obviously not that um, believers didn't already have it, but things, uh, you know, it was, there was something new there. Um, but I don't want to go into a lot of that either. But I've, every believer is indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And I've said that even in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. But we know in Romans, basically, Paul said that anyone who does not have God's Spirit dwelling in them is not, um, you know, it's not of God. And so... That's one of the differences between believers and unbelievers. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I mean, the apostles, the disciples, literally did see Jesus and uh, testify... Um, so, you know, they actually witnessed this. And, uh, again, there's the Savior of the world, and there's the whole Calvinism thing. Okay, in what sense is he the Savior of the world, or what sense is world? And, you know, Calvinists want to play this game where world means Jews and Gentiles. But, obviously, it means that Jesus Christ came and died for everyone. But only those who will turn to him are the only ones who will receive, um, you know, that gift. So, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And this is basically what he said at the first part of this chapter. But now he's saying, you know, not only are they of God, but now he's saying, you know, God dwelleth in them and he in God. That's interesting, too, you know, what sense do we dwell in God? Um, you know, it's very interesting. We're in God's hands. You know, we are adopted sons of God. So and I know that in that sense, we are, we are in God. Um, you know, and we're in communion with God and fellowship with God. He talked about that at the beginning of his epistle also. And we have known and believed that the love of God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And so he's just connecting all these things, you know. Whoever loves others is of God. And whoever is of God, you know, dwells in God, and God dwells in him. And um, he's just kind of connecting all these things together now. Um, it's like one big long chain here. And uh, herein is our love made perfect, 
that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Herein is our love made perfect. Um, which I've said, perfect can mean complete a lot too, and in a sense not not perfect as in God is perfect, you know, in everything that he does. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And so, uh, as Jesus is, you know, a light into the world, a light into men, so are we. We love others as God loves us, and that way we can know that we're of God, and that way we can be secure in our salvation. We can know in the time of judgment that uh, we're on the right side of God. And herein is our love made perfect. So I think, our, I mean, how is our love made perfect? What is he saying here? I think that it's kind of, our love is made perfect because our love is um, the same love as which God loved us. We share that love. And that's how, uh, you know, our love is from a right heart. And... So verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. That's a very interesting verse, and how does that apply to the context of everything? And uh, I don't know. Is he talking about being afraid of Judgment Day? Like if, you know, if you're, if you're unsure, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know, or maybe it's kind of like a reverse thing where he's saying, you know, if you're not made perfect in love or whatever, you should, you should be in fear. Of the, of the day of judgment instead of having boldness uh, perfect love casteth out fear you know if you have the perfect love if you have the love that, that God loves with then you, you don't have fear of the judgment So not completely sure. It seems kind of like the context is of, you know, the Day of Judgment because it's, that's like the immediate context right there. But I'd like to see what commentators have to say on that as well. We love him because he first loved us. That's a really good short verse to memorize. First John chapter 4, verse 19. Very straightforward, very powerful. We love him because he first loved us. It's important to know the love of God towards us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So, again, he's, he's repeating pretty much what he's already said before. The main focus is loving one another and, uh, you know, saying one thing and doing another. Saying that you love God yet hating people. And, um, so I'd like to look into that more. But I think it's pretty straightforward, kind of. Um, he talks, he, he goes into how, you know, you hate people who you see, but you, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Hmm. Something to ponder on.
Hmm. Well, let's finish up with verse 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. And I'm sure there are references to when Jesus, you know, emphatically stated that, basically. You know, the, the commandment is to love God, love your neighbor. Those are the greatest commandments, right? And uh, so maybe he's dealing with a lot of hatred at this time in the church or something. People that were, you know, um, disregarding others. Who needed their assistance or whatever and um, being you know being dismissive or hateful towards others I may mean, have been a big issue there I mean it's still a big issue today obviously it's um, you know so but he's just like pounding this idea in that God is love. And, you know, if we're not loving others as God loves, then, uh, we need to be, basically. So, that's it. Sorry for the pauses and stuff. I'm just trying to think about things, but that's why I gotta take the time to go through and really study this and then come back out with other videos. But, Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something, and I'll have to finish up that last chapter. Thank you. God bless.